week 11 college football picks against the spread and game breakdowns bro week 11 is going to be the separation weekend teams are going to be going one way or the other will alabama or lsu which one will stay in college football playoff competition and which one will be out of there can old miss hold up against georgia we got to talk about all of that and more here on the unafraid show picks against the spread and game breakdowns for this week first game up georgia at old miss plus two and a half Ole Miss has one of the top offenses and defenses in the country. So why was last week versus Arkansas the first time versus a decent opponent that they actually put it all together when they dismantled Arkansas on the road? Now, is dropping 63 on a Razorbacks team that gave up a combined 69 against LSU, Texas A&M, and Tennessee proof that Ole Miss is now ready for Georgia? Or is the old miss team that averaged 22 points over their previous four sec contests the real old miss so will the real old miss please stand up and we're gonna see this week because the rebels take on the turnover happy turnover machine in carson beck and the georgia bulldogs now they've seen their quarterback who they are in love with who they care about and now they're starting to turn on throw more interceptions in the last month than he had his entire career as the Bulldogs quarterback. Now, the dude has 11 interceptions in his last five games. And Georgia is a good team. And they're still good enough to be 4-1 and one over that span. But at some point in time, Georgia is going to run up against somebody who knows what to do with them extra possessions that they getting from those turnovers. And Carson Beck, you can bet he's going to be under pressure this Saturday because Ole Miss ranks first in the SEC in sacks and tackles for loss. And Georgia is 11th in the country over the last three games in drop back passes. So that's going to be plenty of opportunities to get to the quarterback. Now, this would be a game that Georgia might want to rely on its running game. But Trevor Etienne, he got banged up against Florida. And Ole Miss hasn't allowed an opponent to gain over three and a half yards per carry all season. So that means three plus three plus three equals not a first down. That's what that means. So Georgia's going to have to pass the ball. And when you take the names out of it and only focus on this year's results, it seems like Ole Miss should be the favorite. But you cannot ignore Georgia putting up 611 yards on less than 60 plays when this game was in Athens last year. This was an absolute boat race. Now, the dogs don't have Brock Bowers or Kendall Milton or Lad McConkey, but they still have Kirby Smart, and that might just be enough. However, though, I am taking the home team. Give me the Ole Miss Rebels, and this is going to be a game that sends shockwaves through the SEC because of Georgia loss. Boy, oh boy, imagine a world where LSU and Georgia lose this weekend, and they're both sitting potentially on the outside of the college football playoff looking in. Wow. And we're going to take a break from the games for just a second. So you guys can like, subscribe, get notifications, and most importantly, share because the channel is growing and it is thanks to you guys. Next game up, we got Colorado minus three and a half at Texas Tech. Now, if I told you that there's a big 12 team out there that hasn't given up 300 yards passing or 200 yards rushing in a single game this year, you might need 16 guesses before you get to the Colorado Buffaloes. But it is true because last year, this defense was abysmal. It was talked about and it was like, yo, look at Dion, supposed to be a defensive guy, can't put together a competent defense. But those stats matter. And the Buffaloes are out here putting the D in Dion at this point in time. Now, if former longtime Cincinnati Bengals assistant Robert Livingston isn't on the Broyles Award radar, then you got to throw that whole award away because he's one of the most impactful additions in all of college football this year. And the Broyles Award goes to the best assistant coach in the country. And he has to be on that list with what he's doing with this defense. Now, on the other side of things, Texas Tech, 
they just knocked off a previously undefeated Iowa State team that actually put Colorado in a position to be in control of their own destiny in making the Big 12 championship. And now Colorado has to thank the Red Raiders by going into Lubbock and ruining their Saturday. <laughs> it's a cold world out here, man. <laughs> but you got to do what you got to do. Your idols turn into your rivals and then you got to AI them for survival. Just the reality. Now, here's what Texas Tech does well. They feed Taj Boyd. Now, he's rushed for over 100 yards in every game this year and has a 19-game streak of at least 95 yards on the ground. And then their quarterback, Baron Morton, has a great connection with his top three wide receivers, namely Josh Kelly, who will provide an interesting matchup against Travis Hunter because Kelly had 130 yards receiving against Colorado last year when he was at Washington State with who? Cam Ward. Now, his quarterback ain't quite as good, but the player is absolutely a baller. Now, on the defensive side of things for Texas Tech, though, they're in pretty bad shape. But over the last couple weeks, they have seemed to shore up a run defense that was on pace to be the worst in the country. Colorado doesn't run the ball very much, but they did just give Isaiah Agustave 22 carries against Cincinnati. And that's the most that they've had one player carry the ball since Dion took over in Boulder. And where you really have to worry about this Texas Tech defense is in trying to cover Colorado's receiving court because the Red Raiders are giving up 330 passing yards over their last five games. And outside of the TCU game, they've been giving up career games to anybody who wants one from the receiving court. And now they got to deal with LeJonte Webster, Jimmy Horn Jr. and going up against their number two and number three corners while Travis Hunter is out there running routes. Man, this is a prime time scenario for Shadur Sanders to put up all sorts of points. Give me the Buffaloes minus three and a half and watch them get into that college football playoff conversation and I love it. I love it. Everybody who was talking trash about Dion is going to have to eat their words. Now, mind you, I want this because I like a little controversy. And I like when people have to Anita Baker apologize because if you talk trash about him, you have to come back with that same energy praising him. And that's why I'm doing this right now. All right. Uh, we got Alabama at LSU plus three. LSU is at home and an underdog. And you have to wonder if Alabama head coach Kalen DeBoer, if he watched last year's Alabama film against LSU, because if he did, he might not need to cook up his usual elite game plan. Because last year against LSU, Jalen Milrow, the Tides quarterback, carried the ball 20 times for 155 yards. Not one, not two, not three, but four touchdowns. However, though, over the last four SEC contests, Jalen Miro is averaging 27 rushing yards per game. And it makes you wonder if Kalen DeBoer will even try to find out if design quarterback runs are still a weakness for this Tigers defense. And considering South Carolina's quarterback Lenora Sellers had 88 rushing yards and two touchdowns against LSU earlier this season, that should definitely be a a contemplation and part of the game plan. Now on the LSU side of things, Kyron Lacey and Aaron Anderson have been dominating at wideout. And outside of Alabama's win over Georgia, only two receivers this year have even hit 80 yards in a game. Tennessee's Brew McCoy and Wisconsin's Will Pauling have done that. And if LSU wants to win this game, they're gonna have to have a ground attack. But against any legitimate run defense this year, LSU has not looked bad. They have looked absolutely god-awful and terrible. LSU's star freshman running back, Caden Durham, against Ole Miss, Texas A&M, and UCLA. That's right. UCLA is still an elite run defending team. He had a combined 66 rushing yards on 29 carries. Now, everything about this game, outside of the location, sets up for an Alabama route. But Kalen DeBoer, I'm not sure he's not going to big brain this game into a contest by being too cute. Now, if you're game planning for the 2024 LSU Tigers, the right answer is to punch them in the mouth. 
over and over and over and over and over and over again, Marshawn Lynch style. But will Alabama do that? Now, I am going to go with a resounding no on that one. And everything in me wants to pick Alabama to win this game. But I'm not. I'm going to take the LSU Tigers plus three. Now we got a big line alert. Big line alert. <laughs> the Maryland Terrapins head out to Eugene and are 25 point underdogs. Now the question is, does Maryland have a shot in their first ever game in the state of Oregon? Because Maryland has been running a very pass heavy offense under Josh Gaddis but it's an imbalanced offense that has had trouble finishing drives because the Terrapins are fourth in pass attempts per game and 31st in total touchdown passes. And if you are going to hang with Oregon, you need to be able to run the football and Maryland doesn't. And so far it looks like they can't. And this Oregon defense has been very salty because if you are going to drop back pass, the combination of Mateo Uyangalele, Jordan, Jordan, Birch and company are going to be in the backfield. And if you can't run the football, it is going to be a problem. So what about defensively though for Maryland? Because Maryland defends the run well and has talented defensive backs that can literally make plays, but they've given up big plays all year long in the passing game. And this is a team that is 90th in the country in third down defensive conversions allowed. And even without Taz Johnson this game at wide out for the Ducks, this is gonna be a feast for the hyper-efficient Ducks offense. And what I'm looking for from Oregon this week is for Dylan Gabriel to go out there without his top wide receiver and cement his name into the Heisman conversation. Cause he's leading the Big 10 in passing yards and passing touchdowns. And he is leading the entire country in completion percentage. Cause Gabriel's name isn't being floated around as much as it deserves to be like Cam Ward and with Ashton Genty. Because here's the truth, Cam Ward's defense is carrying him to a Heisman finalist. Cause they're giving up so many points, he has no choice but to score a ton of points, which piles up the stats. But that's also the same thing that we saw out of Jaden Daniels winning the Heisman Trophy last year as well, and Caleb Williams at USC the year before. So this has a recipe for it, and Ashton GT has slowed down. So we're gonna see if Dylan Gabriel can put up some gaudy stats in this game to really submit himself as a finalist. But now the ultimate question is, George, who are you taking? Will Oregon cover this 25 points? Here's what I know. Good teams win, great teams cover. And Oregon has been covering this year. So I am going to take the Ducks minus 25. This is going to be an opportunity for them to, with Tez Johnson out, for them to get more of Treshawn Holden, to get more of Evan Stewart in the past game, to potentially get a jury on Dickey sighting, to, to get more out of a big Noah Whittington game at running back because they are not going to burn the candle at both ends with either him or Jordan James to make sure that they are healthy down the stretch. Because the whole entire point for this Oregon team at this point is to be getting better and to be peaking at the right time when it is time to play the Big Ten Championship and then head into the college football playoff. So give me the Ducks minus 25. It is time for the Holy War. BYU minus three and a half at Utah. Now, if I had told you before the season that the Holy War would feature a top 10 undefeated team in the top 25 in scoring defense and offense going up against a four and four team with the 105th ranked offense and a ferocious defense, I would bet my house that you would have told me that it would have been reverse order that it would have been Utah who would have been ranked so high and it would have been BYU sitting at four and four. Cause I know I would have told you the exact same thing. Now BYU at this point in time in the season is on an absolute heater and is only allowing opponents to complete 52% of their passes. And if Utah wants to win this game, they're gonna have to do it on the ground, which if we're being honest, was probably going to be Utah's plan, whether or not Cam Rising was healthy or not. Over the last five meetings, Utah has run 58 more times against BYU than they passed. 
So you let me know what type of physicality that Utah has been doling out. And Utah's true freshman quarterback, Isaac Wilson, was able to get out and run against Oklahoma State. And if the Utes want to win this game, they're going to have to get him out on the run again against BYU. Because the three times this year that the Cougars have been in one score games, the opposing quarterback has had success running the football. Now, offensively for BYU, their quarterback, Jake Retzliff, has made plays when it counts. And he's coming off his most efficient game because he buried UCF on the road in a 34 to 10 hole through three quarters. I'm just glad that the holy war is back because this in-state rivalry deserves to be played every single year. It matters to the people in the state of Utah, despite conference realignment, despite anything else, because it is supposed to be played. Now they have not played since 2021 though. And for Utah fans, Nothing would be more sweet than ruining BYU's shot at a perfect Big 12 season. That would be the redeeming moment in one of the most disappointing seasons that the Utes have had since Kyle Winningham has been in Salt Lake City. So when you look at this game, I believe that BYU will continue to roll because this game matters and it is important and Utah is a little broken right now. We got Washington as almost a two touchdown dog at Penn State. And this is a 13 point line. Now Washington, this season, they are five and oh at home in the friendly confines of Mont Lake. Now they are 0 and four on the road. And this week they're walking into the infamous Penn State whiteout game. If you notice, Penn State didn't do no whiteout last game against Ohio State. They picked an opponent that they thought that they could beat. And I'm telling you this, this is the first time that these two teams have met since Saquon Barkley destroyed Washington's defense in the Fiesta Bowl and the first time that they faced off in the regular season since 1921. And that's when the Huskies were called the Washington Sun Dodgers. <laughs> what? And this is one of the perks of conference realignment is that we do get different matchups like this. They just don't quite matter as much to the fan base in terms of historically, but there will be some rivalries that brew up in over the next few years. Now this year though, Washington's running back Jonah Coleman, who I love, the dude is an absolute NFL player and a stud. He has yet to be held under four yards per carry, and he's going up against a defense that looked impenetrable against the run until games against USC and Ohio State. Now you have to think that if Will Rogers does enough to keep the Nittany Lions defense honest on the back end, then Jonah Coleman is going to have a chance to keep the Huskies in this football game because if they can run the football, this kid is dynamic enough that he will get extra yards. He's built out of that same stuff that Ashton GT is built out of in Boise State. I'm telling you, if you've not watched him, pay attention. Now, offensively for Penn State, though, they continue to run Drew Aller out despite having only two touchdown passes in his last five Big Ten home games. But fans in Happy Valley swear he's not the problem. How good do we think Aller is going to look when against Washington's defense that has held opponents quarterbacks to less than 150 passing yards seven different times this season. And this Penn State offense, it is not dynamic at all. And maybe the loss to Ohio State sparked something in them that says, oh, we got to change how we're doing things. We got to stop playing run and punt football and actually go out there and, dare I say it, push the ball downfield some shots hit some big plays because if you are just planning on running to the sticks and stopping and getting first downs to win it ain't gonna happen pal now the huskies have a shot here not just to cover this spread but to win but where it all might fall apart for jed fish's team is in the red zone because they have been atrocious because they rank 119th in scoring percentage on the road 
in 2024. And even if they improved a little bit in the last month, it is still bad. However, I'm going to do the unthinkable. I am going to go against all common sense. And I'm going to take the Huskies plus 13 because I do believe that they are going to be good enough on the ground to keep this game close, even though Penn State will win. Next game up, Michigan at Indiana, minus 14. Indiana has never had a 10-win season, not in their entire history. They had a 9-0-1 season back about 100 years ago, but that's really about it. And that is absolutely changing this year. And But the question is, will it change this week when Michigan comes to town? Uh, probably. And there is no better indicator than the effect of the transfer portal than a team that last year that lost 56-7 to being a clear favorite against the defending national champs the very next year. How does that happen? You get beat by 40-some points last year, and then the next year, well, against the defending national championships, then the very next year, you are favored by two touchdowns in the game? What? Life comes at you fast in this new normal season. Now, last week against Oregon, Michigan played decent outside of third down, where they were just 4 of 12. But the Wolverines also only ran 41 plays. And you can't run 41 plays against a ranked opponent, especially ones that play fast and loose like Oregon and Indiana. Because nobody in college football has held Indiana under 31 points this season, and it ain't going to start this weekend. Now, the Wolverines have been without a couple of DBs, particularly potential first-round pick Will Johnson, and maybe he's back this week. But even in the one game where Michigan played well against the pass, the Illini dominated the Wolverines on the ground. And this whole uh, quarterback situation between Davis Warren taking the majority of the snaps and then Alex Orgy coming in, running some run plays here and there, this dual quarterback system, it doesn't work. Because when Alex Orgy comes in the game, you know what's happening. You, it, It's either a, a run play, 100% run play, or pretend to be a run play and then try to trick them and, and slide the ball over the top to a one-on-one -on -one player. That's it. Those are the only options. They're not going to let them drop back and pass. It just tips the defense off. And I know that bowl eligibility is on the line for Michigan with three games left to win one, but that conservative style is not going to get it done especially not against Kurt Singetti and the Hoosiers. Now, Michigan might be able to go back to that run and punt offense next week against Northwestern if you want a guaranteed sixth win. But Michigan needs to try to do something different if they want to compete this weekend and also continue to grow. So maybe, just maybe, you can salvage this season by upsetting Ohio State at the end of the year. And that's the college football picks against the spread and game breakdowns for week 11. Make sure that you like, subscribe, tell a friend about the show, and get notifications and share, of course.